well, if you take your Bible, now you don't have to stand yet. I know you're in the habit of doing that, so I'll remind you the first few times. Turn to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. I don't know if you're familiar with the book of Nehemiah, but it has to do with rebuilding. Rebuilding. And so I want to talk with you the next several weeks on rebuilding. This is going to be titled, this message rebuilding, part one, Nehemiah gets a vision, and I won't get through with it this morning. And so I'm going to take my time going through this so that uh, we try to gain uh, as much as we can from God's Word. We're not going to study every word. We're not going to study every phrase. But some things I'll be pointing out to you to, to help you understand the book of Nehemiah much better than you do now. A lot of times people don't like the Old Testament. Well, it's all God's Word. It's all Amen. good. Amen. From cover to cover, it's all good. And God wrote it all. In the book of Nehemiah, there's 13 chapters, there's 406 verses, and there's 10,483 words. Wow. Now, I don't know how many letters there are, but I can tell you now, they're all inspired of God. Right. God wrote every one of them. Every one of them is impor important to me as a Christian to grow by. The, um, the Lord um, said in Matthew 4.4, 4, is that... Um, that is by not by bread alone, but by every word of God that we need to grow as a Christian. You as a Christian, if you're saved this morning, if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, then you need every word in this book. Right. And there's, uh, like I said, 10,483 words in the book of Nehemiah that you need to know, that you need to know what they mean, you need to know uh, how they apply to your life. And so I'm going to help you with that this morning. Now the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, they go hand in hand. The book of Ezra... Uh, this was written uh, about uh, 400 to 500 years before Christ came back. A lot of people don't understand that. You think, well, it's in the middle of the Bible, or, or it's not close to Matthew, so therefore it's, uh, it's, it's way before the Lord's coming back. But no, it's written uh, uh, somewhere around 536 B uh, B.C., just a few years before we have our canon of Scripture. And our canon of Scripture in the Old Testament is talking about from the book of Genesis to the book of Malachi. Right. That's our Old Testament canon. That's 39 books of the Bible. And just like in the New Testament, you have 27 books. That is from Matthew to the book of Revelation. That's a canon, is what it's called. And so therefore we have uh, in, uh, in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, they go hand in hand. This is talking about when the children of Israel was in captivity. Was in captivity and that uh, they were sinful, they were wicked, they had rebelled against God, they had had false idols and, and, and different things in their life that God had commanded them not to do, and they rebelled against God. And so therefore, God put them in captivity. You read about the book of Ezra, uh, there's two captivities, and here in the book of Nehemiah, you read about a third captivity, a partial captivity, uh, about the children of of Israel. You say, what's important about that? Well, you'll see in just a few moments, but it tells us about the condition that Jerusalem was in and that they had a sinful condition. The walls of Jerusalem were broken down because uh, Babylon had come and, and they had de uh, destroyed them and, and, and that the walls were torn down, the, the gates were, born, were, were burned with fire, and many of the people were taken off into captivity to be slaves. And some of them, the remnant, there was a small remnant that was left behind there in Jerusalem. And so therefore, this is what this is about. The first seven chapters is a very easy outline for the whole book of Nehemiah. And I'll repeat this several times as I'm preaching to this. The first seven chapters is talking about rebuilding the walls. Rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem. Talking about the place of Jerusalem. Then chapters 8 through 13 is talking about rebuilding the workers. Rebuilding the workers. That's the people, the Jews. So therefore you have rebuilding uh, the place of Jerusalem and not only the walls, but the workers. You know, that's what we need in our Christian lives. Right. Sometimes we need walls rebuilt in our marriages. Sometimes we need walls built in our spiritual lives. We need walls built in our churches. Right. And as workers, as the body Amen. of Christ, if you're saved this morning, you're a part of the body of Christ. And we as workers need... Some things in our life sometimes that need to be reworked. We need some things that need to be rebuilded. Such as sometimes as a Christian, me as myself, as a pastor sometimes, I get lax sometimes and I get lazy. I don't know about you, and sometimes I might skip a day reading my Bible as a preacher. Now I know I've been where you are, and I'm, 
I miss days of reading my Bible. I get busy, the phone rings, things, you know, I wake up late and things get going and I had an appointment. And before you know it, the whole day is gone. You ever get like that? I right, mean, right, man. Amen. And man, I look back over the day and I start laying my head in the bed and I say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've gone a whole day without spending any time with you. Right. Huh? Right. Like that? Yep. Those Amen. are things in our Christian walk that needs to be rebuilt. What about our prayer life? It's the same way. I don't know about you, but that is the hardest thing that I have a problem with is praying. Right. Amen. Everything else is so much more important than praying. It really is. Right. It, it's really not, but that's the way we feel like sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. That we get so busy in our Christian lives that we don't take time to pray. Amen. Maybe, maybe you don't go to church regularly anymore. Maybe you got in the way, and I understand that. When our, our son died, I'll be honest with you, I had a hard time going to church. I stayed out of church sometimes. I made excuses. I, I, said, I said, I don't want to go. I don't feel good. I made up lies. My wife would go and take the girl. No, I just play out loud. Right. I was in a valley. You ever been in a valley? Right. You ever been in a place where you didn't think that God cared and the world didn't care? That's where I was at. And I'm sure that's where you've been. Right. And man, I just, I just make excuses. I don't go to church. Nobody don't care about me there. Preacher don't care. People don't care. God don't care. He let my son die. You know? Right. Well, those are some walls that I had to rebuild in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. Some walls in all of our lives that need to be rebuilt spiritually. Sometimes we need to rebuild some walls of Christian love. Right. So, you know, yeah. a lot of times Christians and Baptists are the same way. We get very judgmental about this race of people or, or, uh, or this type of person where they don't look like me, they don't dress like me, they don't part their hair just like me, you know. So, we got to part my hair. So, therefore, we get very judgmental. We need to rebuild some walls. And that's what needs to be done here in the book of Nehemiah. I want you to turn, hold your place there in Nehemiah, and turn over to Proverbs, and, and you can turn when you find, I mean, you can stand when you find it. Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs 29 and verse 18. This here is written by Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. You say, what about Einstein? Well, Einstein didn't believe, the, believe God. Right. He was an agnostic. He didn't believe God. But Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. I've questioned that at one time in my life. He married all them women. Right. <laughs> anyway, verse 18. Solomon said... Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. But Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, God, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for everyone that's here. Lord, if someone's here lost today, I pray to God that you would help them to see their need to accept Christ as their Savior. I pray, Lord, for those that are saved. Maybe they've wandered from you and they've wandered far from home. Lord, they need to come back and they need to rebuild some walls in their life. I pray to God that you'd help them to do so. I pray to the Lord that this message be the message they need to hear on this particular Sunday morning. And we ask these things in Jesus' name because you're worthy. Amen. 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 See you. Stay in there in the book of Proverbs for just a moment. Now, doctrinally speaking, this is not talking about having a vision. It's not having a dream or a goal. It's talking about the Word of God in this context. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law. The law is God's word. Amen. Right, That's amen. the book that you hold in your hand, I hope, the King James Bible. Amen. Amen. It says, happy is that person. So it's talking about there in that day, the people who did not keep God's word, they had no vision. Those people that did not keep God's word close to their heart, and they did not follow it and obey it, then those people would eventually perish. <clears throat> right. Because God's Word, as we say, it's our road map. But how many of us pick it up? Right. If it was your road map, yeah, I mean, and you never pick it up, then you wouldn't know where to go. Right. Now, we just traveled seven hours. It took us ten hours to get here, I think. But it, we had a couple of stops to do. But I had a GPS, which I like. Because I don't <laughs> like looking at a map going seven hours away. <laughs> You're bound to miss a few turns, but we bound to miss a turn anyway in, in Atlanta. Uh, right on the other side of Atlanta, my wife did. But anyway, 
What good is the GPS or what good is the map if you never pick it up? Right. right. It's true. It's kind of like men. You know how men are. All y'all women can say amen here now. <laughs> you got a problem with men? women saying amen? <laughs> how many of y'all's wives or ladies or mothers or sisters or daughters or whatever can stand and give a witness and say, I've seen my dad, my brother, uh, my husband buy something and start putting it together and never read the instructions? <laughs> right. I'm the same way. I got a neighbor back home. He just bought a bought a a ceiling fan. I told him, I said, Hey, why don't you look at the instructions? No, I don't need to. I said, Okay, go ahead. He started putting it together. He said, What all these all extra parts are? I said, Why don't you read the instructions? <laughs> he said, No, I don't need to read the instructions. So we end up with all these extra parts and do a couple things over again. Why do you read the instructions? You know, us men are made that way. We don't want to read the instructions. We don't want to look at the map. We can find it. We know a shortcut. Yeah, Isn't that right. the way we are, us men? That's what right. I know. I'm not, I got a better way. You know I do it, so it don't matter. Yeah. Uh, I put it together better than it was intended to put together. Yeah, right. And so uh, that's the way we are. But God's Word is our roadmap. Right. This is what we're supposed to live by. We say, hey, this is our final authority. Right. But yet we never open it to find out what it says. Right. We never look into it and gaze into it and say, man, this is what God wants me to do with my life. Right. Hey, this is what God wants me to do in the future. Hey, this is how God wants me to act on the job. Hey, now, I, this is how I'm supposed to treat my, my wife. This is how I'm supposed to treat my children. This is how I'm supposed to treat my husband. It tells you everything in here. It's just right. a matter of opening it up and rightly dividing it and then obeying it. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I mentioned in Sunday school, the most miserable people in the world are those that are saved outside of God's will. Right? I've been there. The most miserable time in my life was when I was running from God, out of God's will, doing my own thing. Right. Amen. I was miserable. And that was right after our son died. I was so miserable and so low, I thought about killing myself. You ever been that low? Yep. You ever said, man, there's no purpose in living? Yeah. I want to just give up. That was me. I had a plan. Right. I had a way to do it. I had a way to back it up. To make sure it got done. I had a date and a time. I won't do it. On the same date my, my, my son died, I want to do it right there on his grave. I had a way to it. He was right there on the main highway. I knew how to do it. I had the way to do it. Because I had given up. I would quit. i had been so low in the valley. And I didn't have a Christian to turn to. Because everybody wanted to judge you. Everybody wanted to put you down. I had people at our, funeral, at the, our son's funeral walk by the cat and said, You had enough faith your son be living. And i tell you what. I really want to punch somebody in the mouth. <laughs> right. Right. I really want to get in the flesh. Right. That's not the right thing to say to somebody standing there can't you? Right. It's not biblical, first off. Right. And that was the most miserable I was. I was the most miserable to my family. I was the most miserable to my wife. I was the most uh, miserable to my parents. And all I put them through through that, you know why? Because I wouldn't surrender to God. Right. I was not committed to what he wanted me to do, and that was to preach. That's why God took my son. He wanted to get my attention. Right. And I was the most miserable. Happy was I? No. You know why? Because I didn't keep his word. Right. I didn't keep his word. But boy, as soon as I yielded, as soon as I said, Lord, I'm sorry, I give you my life. I'll do whatever you want me to have you do. I'm your table. Then my life began to change. The peace of God... Yeah. Came on me. There's a difference between the peace of God and the peace with God. Right. God began to use me. Joy came back in my heart. Love. Oh, I love to go to church. I love to read the Word of God. I got things right with my family. I got things right with the Lord. And boy, I was a different person. Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm afraid sometimes in our churches we think well, everybody that's at church or they're spiritually right with God and they're on fire for God, but that's not true. Right. Not true. 
Sometimes we think, well, the Sunday school teacher's right with God. Sometimes the Sunday school teacher's not right with God. Right. Sometimes the preacher's not right with God. I'm a human being. Right. I have the same desires that you do. I have the same flesh that you walk in. Where there is no vision, the people perish. All through the Word of God, you see men who had a vision to do something for God that God had given them. Well, God has given us a vision as a church. He's given me a vision. Now, if you turn back over to Nehemiah, if you still got your place there, I don't know how far we're going to get in this. I'm going to have to put my phone up here, I guess, so I can see the time. I believe that we as a church ought to have a vision. Amen. A person that has no vision, they're really not going anywhere. Right. Right. You might be going around in circles. You might be heading over there and back over there and back over here and going backwards sometimes and forward. And... But a person with a vision, they're looking. They're looking at the mark. It's like you're shooting a bullseye. You know what you're looking at. You know where you're headed. You know where, when you go shoot that arrow, you know where the arrow's headed. That's what you want to hit. Well, we as a church, we need to know what our target is. Right. We know where our vision is, where we're going, where we're headed. I can't tell you when we're going to get there, but I can tell you where we're headed. <clears throat> Here, in chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu. Now Chislu was basically between November the 25th and December the 25th on our calendar. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's very important when you get to chapter 2. In the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace. Now Shushan the palace was 800 miles from Jerusalem. That's very important to know that. So what's the big deal about that? Well, it would make a big deal if you had to walk it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Amen. Now, we didn't. We traveled 400 miles the other day. And it took us straight shot to be seven hours. Well, I wouldn't want to walk 800 miles. I don't know about you. I know Brother Mike. He, he rides a bike, and I wouldn't want to ride that either. <laughs> but by the way, you might have a car. Brother Mike needs a vehicle. Right. We'll be praying, Brother Mike, get a vehicle. <clears throat> right, man. Don't have to be a new vehicle. Something to get some wheels. Anyway, I wouldn't want to walk no 800 miles. Right. I would want to walk 10 miles. <laughs> My fellows, I wouldn't walk into the kitchen table. Amen. 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 So, Shushan, the palace, was 800 miles from Jerusalem. So, it is obvious that Nehemiah, the man of God, he was a prophet, and he was not there in Jerusalem. It's not like today you can go jump on a plane and you can go there in just a, an hour and a half or two hours. That would take a long time. I don't know. I ain't figured that up how many miles a person can walk in a day. Um, but it would take quite a while. I was right. Uh, more than I would want to walk and you too. But I want you to turn, hold your place there. Turn over one page, probably to chapter 2 and verse 12. Nehemiah says, And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man, and listen to this phrase, what my God had put in my heart to do. What my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Now turn back to chapter 1, verse 1. It is obvious that God gave Nehemiah a vision. God had put something in his heart to do in Jerusalem. Nobody knew about it yet, not even at this point. Not even through chapter 1, not till after that. In chapter 2, what I just read, does Nehemiah share what his vision is? But he begins to get a vision. God put something in his heart to do. And I believe that he sent for some men back in Jerusalem, personally. Some people say, well, I don't believe they sent, they, they just came. I don't believe so. Remember, we're talking about the children of Israel that are in captivity. 
in Shushan the palace there, in the capital. Why would you leave Jerusalem that you're not in captivity and go to where you would be in captivity? Yeah, amen. Right. Why would you do that? Not have the right mind unless the man of God called for him. Right. And there was a reason why the man of God called for these men. We're going to see that. In verse 2 it says, And Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. Now what he's talking about here is that whenever a, a country overtakes another country, certainly there's a lot of people killed. But then when it gets towards the end of the battle, they begin to take prisoners for slaves. They begin to take people captive. But sometimes people hide. They hide in the bushes. They hide in caves. They hide under a rock. They hide anywhere. Right. And those are the few that are left there in Jerusalem that, uh, uh, that Nehemiah called for. Some of those men were left there of the captivity. In verse 3, And they said unto me, The remnant, that's the remnant, that's the remaining of the people that's in captivity, the, those that were left behind, and the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. I want you to see, first of all, as Nehemiah gets a vision, how does he get a vision? How does he get a vision? The first thing is that he requ the request of Nehemiah in verse 2. Go back to verse 2. That, hey, Nanny, one of my brethren came, he and certain men of Judah... And I asked them. That is the very first way to get a vision. Nehemiah simply asked a question. Right. That shows that he was concerned. He was concerned about his homeland of Jerusalem. He was concerned about the people. You know what? A lot of times in churches, people come in and out the door, and nobody ever asks how they're doing. Right. You know what? Here lately, we've been visiting around different churches in Asheville. We went to some churches, nobody ever asked, nobody ever did this, nobody ever done anything. Nobody ever visit, nobody ever called, nobody ever come by. You know why? Some people just don't care. Right. right. Not, and that's in our Baptist churches, not Methodist or Catholic or anything else. Talk about Baptist. Right. Baptist. I'm a Baptist. And that's a shame. Nehemiah asked a question because he was concerned about people. He wanted to know, how is my hometown? Even though Nehemiah had probably never been there. Maybe he had, I don't know. The Bible don't tell us. He wanted to know, how is Jerusalem doing? What is the condition of the walls and, and the city? He was concerned. We see that by him sending for, for these men to come tell him the condition. We see that in the fact that he asked a question. Now we as Christians, we ought to be asking questions Amen. for one another. Amen. That's how you show your concern. Now, there's a difference in being, being nosy and being concerned. Right. And being a busybody. Right. The Bible talks awful bad about that, being a busybody. Right. That's sticking your nose in someone's business that, that you don't need to be there. Right. You stick it in too far, so to speak. Right. Now, we ought to be concerned about our brother and sister. They're going through hard times and they're going through uh, a valley. Man, we ought to be there. Right. We ought to be there to help them. And that's what Nehemiah does here. He asks a question. We as Christians ought to ask some questions sometimes to our brothers and sisters. Like, simply, can I help you? Right. I need a hand. I got a bad back, but I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. Uh, I'm not feeling good, but hey, I'll come out anyway and do something. I'll cut your grass when you're going on vacation. And I know that you've been in the hospital and you've been sick. I'll, I'll bring you a couple of meals. Send a card. Right. Make a phone call. Go wash their car. Slip them a few dollars. Do something. Right. Show them that you care. Ask questions. And, and if you have any sense of discernment about you as a Christian, and I would suggest you get something and you get through the Word of God. Discernment is, you know, most people will say, oh, I don't need nothing. 
But really what they're trying to say, and I can tell you this from my own experience, yeah, please help me. Right. I need some help. Right. Will somebody help me? But a lot of times we're proud and we don't want people, we don't want to bother people. Right. I'm that way, you don't want to bother nobody. They're busy and I'm busy and we're all busy people. And we hate to ask for help. Right. But Nehemiah, he asked some questions. He was concerned. Verse 2, certain men of Judah there came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews. That word concerning, you see the, you see the word there? The root word for concerning is concern. He was concerned. Now a lot of times we just don't care. We're not concerned about one another as Christians. And that's a shame. Right. We as a church, boy, we want to show concern for others. And not just the saved. Right. Where's it say you're supposed to show concern just for the saved? Don't say that. The Bible says all through the, the book about the poor. You're supposed right. to be concerned for the poor. I get money all the time for the poor, the homeless, whatever. I've worked in a homeless shelter. We work down in the projects in Atlanta, knocking on doors. Boy, did we get some strange look. We have a white family in a black neighborhood. Nothing against, they ain't being racial. I'm just being honest. People are doing drugs, and if I'd been in the white neighborhood, they'd been doing drugs too in Atlanta. Right. There was no difference, just a different neighborhood. Right. Our church was there, and we knocked on door after door after door after door. You know what? We got some funny looks, like, what are you doing here? And yeah, we were scared, but we did it anyway. Right. You know why? God told me to go ye into all the world. Right. God's grace is for every race. Amen. Boy, we knock on those doors and week after week. I had pockets full of bubble gum. I, and I give to the, all the little kids. Full long, boy, they said, Hey, preacher Mark. Hey, preacher Mark. They come up to me and I give them bubble gum. I said, Hey, you come to church? And, and boy, we had 40 and 50 and 60 people come to church. I was trying to build a youth group for a church that asked me to come help them build a youth ministry. Well, we got the moms and daddies to come. Moms and daddies. And little, this one little black lady, I can't remember her name. She invited us over for uh, for 4th of July. Sweetest little black lady. Man, she was just so sweet. Man, she could fix barbecue chicken and, and ribs. She fixed it. I said, hey, what do you want me to bring? She said, you just come, preacher, enjoy yourself. I want you to meet my family. And boy, I mean, we just had a great time. And we was welcome in that community. You know what? That wouldn't happen if we wasn't concerned. Right. Mm -hmm. you got to show concern. Forget about the color of your skin. Forget right. about all the differences you've been taught and all that garbage. Right. Amen. God died for them. Right. God died for me. And God, by the way, is not white or black. Right. He's a Jew. Right. He's not. He's not uh, somewhere in the middle. You ever seen a Jew? That's what color he is. <laughs> he's not me he's not white skin you know got blonde hair and blue eyes right. you know that's what you know people paint him as but that's not Jesus he was a Jew and he died for me and he died for you and if it wasn't for God's grace we'd be in hell Amen. right Amen. that's why it's true I strive so hard to talk to people and, and give out gospel tracts everywhere I go I was teaching Hannah Getting a little sidetracked, that's okay. The next day I'm going to preach on this walk. <laughs> we had Hannah out the other day at McDonald's. I said, okay, Hannah? I said, before we had the van. I said, okay, everybody grab some gospel tracts. And, go. <laughs> and I, so everybody had gospel tracts. I said, I'm going to teach you how to hand out some gospel tracts today. And so, uh, and so I, I, I put them in different places. And I said, Amy, take her to the bathroom and show her how to hand out gospel tracts in the, in the bathroom at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't go in there. Okay. <laughs> so, so I went in the van and had gospel tracts. And there's some guy in there. I said, "Here, take one of these." <laughs> <laughs> and then we was coming out and had them chairs there. And I said, "Man, what you do? You take the stop of tracks and you fold it and you stick it in that thing. And someone's gonna come. And they're gonna sit at that table and they're gonna be, hey, what's that? They'll read that gospel track. Right. You say, what if they do? Throw it away. Who cares? Leave it alone. <laughs> the wind will blow it. <laughs> I've had people call me saying, you know, I found that gospel track. I found it on the pavement." Yeah. Right. Someone threw down. I thank you for that gospel thing. Yeah, show some, some concern. That's what 
Nehemiah did. He had compassion for sinning for Hanani and his brethren. The word compassion means suffering with another. Have you suffered with anybody in the church lately? You have compassion to what Christ had? He had compassion on me and you. Right. Did he suffer for you? He suffered for me. Amen. With the stripes, we are healed. Right. He shed his precious blood. He was nailed to a cross. And by the way, he rose again. Amen. Amen. That's why we're here today. Amen. Right. Praise the Lord. I know this isn't your traditional resurrection or Easter sermon, <laughs> but this isn't a, a regular service because this is our first service. Right. But I can assure you, I do believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection hey, of Jesus man. Christ. Amen. And there is no such thing as Good Friday, by the way. Amen. He did not rise on Friday or Saturday. He rose on Sunday morning, the Bible tells us. Right. And he was nailed to a cross, the Bible specifically tells you, at 12 o'clock uh, a.m. on Wednesday. He stayed on there three hours. And then he was put in the grave before 6 o'clock. Right. It says he's in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, just like Jonah was in the heart of the, the well, the heart of the earth, three days and three nights. Right. There's no way you can get three days and three nights between Friday and Sunday. Right. Impossible. Anyway, compassion means suffering with another. A sensation of sorrow excited by the distress or misfortunes of another. Compounded of love and sorrow. Has your love been compounded lately for another person? You know, I read this morning about we being in, a, in Sunday school about we have the body of Christ and we're all different members. And when one suffers, we all suffer. The Bible right. says we're supposed to. Right. When one's happy, boy, we all should be happy. Boy, when when uh, when little Jonathan gets saved, I believe he will. Right, man. I hope he will. Amen. You should be praying for little Jonathan gets saved. Amen. Right. Come on with that. Won't save him. Pray the Holy Spirit to convict him when he gets right. to that right age. Right. But boy, when he gets saved, boy, we're going to have a shout and fit. Boy, we're going to have a good old time. There's another child of God been born to the family. Right. right. But when someone loses a loved one, we all want sorry. Right. When someone's going through a hard time, boy, we're all over fit. We want to help them. We want to show concern. The word concern means to reach. Reach out. Sometimes it's doing this. You gotta do something. Right. You don't have to do anything amazing. In fact, the best thing to do is probably keep your mouth shut. Right. If you start to say something, right. you're gonna mess up probably. <laughs> right. Because we had it happen to us over and over and over. Yeah. Somebody would say, Oh, I know how you feel. I said, No, you don't. Right. You know how I feel. You say, Well, I've lost a son, so I know exactly how you feel. No, I'm different than you. I'm different than you. If you were to lose your son, brother, I would never tell you I know how you feel. Right. I might tell you, I know how I feel. I know what I went through. I don't know how you feel. Right. He does. Right. He used to reach out, to extend, to look up, to take an interest in. Then if you don't be concerned for people in the house of God, boy, yeah, take an interest in. Right. I wonder if I were to ask you today, if I were to bring up someone's name, I'm not going to do that. Could you name me three or four things about that person? Could you do that? Could you tell me two or three things that someone's going through in their life right now that's really hard for them? If you couldn't do that, then it shows that you're not being concerned. We need to be concerned for one another. See, if we're not concerned about one another in the house of God, how are we going to be concerned about the lost man? Right. That's going to cuss you out. Right. Slam the door in your face. And throw a gospel track in your face. Right. And tell you, get off my property before I sue you. Right. How are you going to be concerned for them if you're not concerned for one another? And we're supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Right. Right. Amen. we got to show concern for one another. That's what Nehemiah did. He showed concern for the Jews. 
by asking the question and concern for Jerusalem. Nehemiah was living in Shushan the palace. Well, the palace was not a homeless shelter, okay? The palace, even though he had a very dangerous job, job he was a cupbearer before the king. Meaning everything that the king would put to his lips, he had to taste or drink or eat. Just in case it was poison. So if it was poison, Nehemiah would fall over dead. So God was watching over him. Right. To get him to where he needed him to be. Yeah. He had a very dangerous job. I wouldn't want it. He was living in style. He was living in luxury. He got to eat the best of food. Because he got to eat the king's food. He got to drink the king's drink. He got taken well care of. But yet, regardless of where he was at, he was still concerned for his brethren. So you might be on a mountaintop today. You might be having it the best you've ever had. You might have the best job you ever had, making the most money you ever had. Cars are working perfect. Uh, things are going great. Your relationships are wonderful. And many times when we get like that, you know, we forget about the other ones. Right. We forget about our brethren in Jerusalem. Right. With the walls torn down and the gates are burned. We forget that they're still in captivity. They're not doing so good as we are sometimes. But that's what Nehemiah did. He was in Shushan, the palace. You know, many times in our life, it's sad to say, and I'll close here with this, God has to make us leave our comfort zone right, right. before we really get concerned. Right. right. God has to say, I'm going to knock him down a couple of notches. He's a little too big for his britches. Right. You hear, my mom was telling me, my daddy done that. He knocked me down many times. Uh, <laughs> not knocked me down, but he, he put me in my place. In right. Field. I needed a few more. Didn't hurt me, by the way, either. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't think so. <laughs> no, it didn't hurt me. God has to put us in places, put us in valleys. Sometimes we say, why in the world did God do that? Maybe it's to wake you up. Right. Get concerned for other people. <clears throat> Nehemiah had a vision. The very first thing in getting a vision is he made a request. He showed some concern in the form of a question. <clears throat> I encourage you today, as we begin to continue to talk about rebuilding and getting a vision, don't be just concerned about little old you. Right. And I'm not going to be concerned about little old me. We need to be concerned for one another. Amen. When you go through the drive through at McDonald's, when you go to the steakhouse, you'll show concern for that person that has a soul Amen. that's going to spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven or hell. You don't have time to possibly, physically, witness to every person you meet. But you can take a gospel trap and say, can I give you one of these before I leave? You say, what if they say no? Just put it on the counter and walk off. Leave it alone. Let somebody else pick it up. Show some concern for people. They have a soul. Just like everyone in here today has a soul. Right. You say, well, my, my, my goal in life, my vision is to make a bunch of money. Well, that's fine if you do it in the right way. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with tithing on it. Nothing wrong with giving part of it to the Lord. God blesses you with something, you'll give back to Him. Right. But if that's only your goal, right. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Right. There's nothing more valuable than your soul. I was talking to someone the other day about Christ and <laughs> talking with them about their soul. I said, your soul's going to live for eternity. That's the only thing that's going to live for eternity, your soul. This body's going to die. Right. It's going to go back to the ground. It's going to go back to dust and worms, and yeah. like the Bible says. Yeah. But your soul will live for eternity. Right. If you're here today and you never trusted Christ as your Savior, Christ died on Calvary for your sins. Amen. He shed His precious blood. 
He asked you a question today. Would you like to go to heaven? You can go to heaven. You can know where you're going to go if, you're going to, if you die. So I really would like to, preacher. I like to know about that, that joy you're talking about, that peace. You know, you're talking about all these things and Boy, but my life's really a mess. You just don't understand. And you're right, I don't. But I know someone who does. I know someone who knows everything about you. And you know what? He still loves you. He still loves your soul. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Believeth. Amen. Believe that He died for your sins. Believing that you are a sinner, that you deserve hell, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Recognizing that you are a sinner, that you deserve hell. A payment has to be made for your sin. But thanks be to God, when He died on Calvary and He shed His precious blood, He paid that sin that Amen. Amen. So you don't have to go to hell. Amen. Then He was buried. And it don't just stop there. Right, man. Because if it just stopped at the grave, what good does that do me? Amen. If he can't raise himself, how can he raise me? Amen. Right. If he can't get victory over death in the grave, how can he give me victory over death in the grave? Amen. Because when Jesus rose from the dead three days <clears throat> later, with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of witnesses, not just found in the Bible, but through history, Right. It ain't just bloppy well the Bible. What about, okay, aside from the Bible, even though that's our final authority, all through history, if you go back to history books, Jesus was a real, live human being that lived some 2,000 years ago, and he died on Calvary. He was nailed to a cross, and he was put in a tomb. And you go to that tomb today. The bones are not there. Amen. But you know what? You go to Buddhists, you can go to Muhammad's, and their bones are still there. Amen. Right. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. If you believe that, the death and the burial and the resurrection, you believe that. You can trust in that. And that's how you're saved. Simply trust in what He's done for you at Calvary. And you can be saved. It's that simple. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. I'm ask Miss Jenna to come and I don't know what song she knows, but play a song. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask you a moment to close your eyes. Bow your head. And she begins to sing softly. I don't know your heart condition. It's none of my business other than I'm a pastor and I'm concerned. If you need to come forward today and trust Christ, we'll be happy to show you how in the Word of God. Maybe you're wandered far from God. And you need to come home. You come home. We won't bother you. If you want someone to pray for with you, we'll be happy to pray with you. If you want to be left alone, that's fine. We won't bother you. We invite you to, today to come to this old fashioned altar and ask Christ to, to help you. Maybe you haven't had the concern that you need to have. Maybe there's some walls in your life that need to be rebuilt. However, God spoke to your heart, you obey Him. of 28 people it's hard to believe that everybody's right because I know human nature human nature sitting there telling you well I ain't got to go for it I ain't got to go for it somebody's going to think bad about me somebody's going to look down the nose and say look at them They're, they've sinned so what it's not between you and them it's between you and God you will stand and give account one day for the message you've heard did you obey the Holy Spirit as he stands there he says hey you need to get right. You need to do what's right with God. You haven't been faithful to church. You come forward and get that right. Okay. I appreciate it.
everybody this morning being here. I hope that you've obeyed the Holy Spirit yes. with your heart. And if you didn't, you know what? You can still get it right. Amen. Right. Amen. Yep. Amen. You can pray in the car. You can pray Amen. going down the road, walking, Amen. riding the bike. You can pray at work. Just do it the way God wants you to do it. Right. That's the key. Well, 